So we talk a lot about hormones in the bone health world, and for good reason. Hormones are a powerful tool for bone health, each one of the primary sex hormones. But a study was just released on May 1st of this year, so it's two days ago as of this recording, and it is a must review for anyone that is concerned about the risks of hormones, concerned about hormones at all, and wondering about the benefits of hormone for fracture. We receive so many comments around hormone replacement therapy. Our community is filled with inquisitive women and men looking for answers. If you have a story to share about HRT, success, failure, frustration, leave us a comment on YouTube. Hearing these stories helps us to come up with the videos that are gonna be most impactful for our audience. So again, if you're comfortable sharing your story, please do so on YouTube, appreciate it. All right, so this publication that came out just a couple of days ago is essentially a 20 year follow up of the Women's Health Initiative, that study that came out in the early 2000s. So I'm gonna review this paper in two parts. So one is the HRT part that I'm gonna to do today, and the other is the calcium and vitamin D trial that I'm gonna do in another video, because I wanna keep these at least somewhat digestible and relevant to what you're looking for. I'm also gonna share with you exactly how we are using HRT to date, and what we're doing, or at least our efforts around how we're using them to improve bone health and how this paper impacts that medical decision making, because it actually does. The Women's Health Initiative, or WHI, was the largest study of women's health done in the United States, and it enrolled over 161,000 postmenopausal women aged 50 to 79. The goal was to inform clinical practice about the prevention of chronic disease, healthy aging, and health effects of three different things, hormones, calcium, vitamin D, supplementation, and dietary approach. There were actually four trials that occurred here. So there were two uh, specific hormone trials. So there was a combined group, and I'll explain what that means. And then there was an estrogen only group. There was a calcium vitamin D trial, and then there's a dietary modification trial. But let's look at the, the spe specifically the two hormone trials. So the combined arm, which is estrogen and synthetic progesterone or progestin in one arm, and then estrogen alone in the other arm, and we'll save the rest for another day. All right, so to understand these two, we'll call them arms, or these two sp specifically different trials, these two trials used forms of drugs that are still available today, but not as popular, but they were the way to do a hormone replacement then. The two drugs that they used are an oral estrogen, specifically called conjugated equine estrogen, or the brand name at the time, still is, is Premarin. And then the other group used Premarin and an oral synthetic progesterone called medroxyprogesterone acetate. So to understand the difference between the two formulations and the two different trials that occurred here around menopausal hormone therapy, we have to start by understanding what they were using. So there's some criticism around what they were using because the things that they used then, which were popular then, are not really popular now, although they are still available and they are still used. The estrogen that they used is called conjugated equine estrogen, or CEE. And the brand name at the time, and still is, is Premarin. And the other group used CEE plus a synthetic progesterone or progestin called medroxyprogesterone acetate or MPA. So you had a group that was combined therapy, and that's what I'll say moving forward, combined therapy, which was the CEE and MPA. And then you had the estrogen only group, which is CEE, again, not estradiol, but CEE. And that was given to women that had had a hysterectomy because the belief is that you only need progesterone to balance estrogen in the uterus rather than across all the tissues in the body. So here's the challenges around these two things. So oral estrogens we know have the potential to increase the risk of blood clot. That is controversial, but we see it time and time again. Maybe it was the CEE or maybe it's just the oral formulation. Either way, that's not what we do in practice. But when we go through these data, what you'll see is that there is this risk of, of blood clot, pulmonary embolism, et cetera. And I think that's because of the oral formulation. Now the synthetic progestin, that MPA, we know that these molecules are devious. And I'll show you in this study just how devious they appear with this new long-term data. And it's really compelling of, from this and numerous other studies that when we look at some of the negatives in here that likely the progestin was at least partially, if not completely responsible for some of these bad things. Some other issues are around the research group. The Women's Health Initiative has been criticized for bringing in an older group of women 
not because we don't want to serve older women, but the issue is, is that they were looking for women that did not have symptoms of menopause because they knew that if they gave them a placebo estrogen, <laughs> they would know. And so if they re received this placebo and they had symptoms and their symptoms didn't go away, they would likely quit the, quit the study. And so they had to wait until women were far enough out from menopause or didn't have symptoms early in menopause to enroll them in the study. And so what we can see here is that the average age of women in the intervention group was 63.3 years. So going to be on average 13 years after the onset of menopause, right? The age range actually went from 50 to 79. So there was someone as old as 79 years old that was enrolled in the study looking at menopausal hormone therapy, which is traditionally, uh, at least in the recent years, going to be prescribed for women that are within 10 years of onset of menopause. So there's some challenges here where the intervention group is not really the same group that we're going to look at uh, when we're traditionally considering menopausal hormone therapy. Another issue with an older group is that as women age, especially without sex hormones, their comorbidities are going to increase. The risk of having a diabetic, having metabolic dysfunction, having cardiovascular disease, right? Having high blood pressure, being on medications for all those things. All of those numbers go up as that population ages. So they are going to be, by definition, a higher risk group than if we were to look at a group of women that are just 50 to 59. All right, so let's look at the long-term follow-up of the combined group first. So the combined group of women had over 16,000 women in it. Now, a little over 5,000 of them were in that age 50 to 59. So it's actually, you know, it's about a third, which isn't bad. This trial was stopped in 2002, or at least it was published in 2002. This was stopped 3.3 years early because of the recommendation from the, da the Data and Safety Board. They'd been on the intervention for a little over five years, and the concern was is that the potential risks were outweighing the potential benefits. Now, this is where things get really, really sticky. So stick with me as I go through this, because this is really, really important. So when we look at the, the results from the original study, what we find is that indeed pulmonary embolisms, that's a blood clot in your lungs, stroke, which is usually a blood clot or a bleed in your brain, were definitely higher. Invasive breast cancer rates of diagnosis was on the border of being significant. It wasn't actually reaching that, but it was certainly on the way and it's in a big enough group or that is, that's a real problem. So a lot of people would say that they should never have stopped the study. I would disagree. They actually had these clear data outlined and they knew that if they reached these thresholds, they should stop the study and they should have stopped the study. So they did the right thing. However, <laughs> what came out of stopping the study, I think was incorrect. And I'll explain that in a minute. But what they also don't talk about here is that there was, an, there was a clear improvement in colon cancer risk initially, and there was a clear reduction in hip fracture risk in the women who were on the intervention. So that's kind of cool. Now, here's what happened. In 2002, when this publication came out, the takeaway by the media, by the medical societies, and by the vast majority of the doctors was that, oh my gosh, Hormone therapy, specifically estrogen, causes cancer. Nobody should be on estrogen therapy, and millions, tens of millions of women were taken off of their hormone therapy. A lot of you might remember this. Taken off their hormone therapy, had terrible symptoms, and doctors refused to treat them. And then, for an entire generation moving forward, women have had a hard time finding a doctor that will have the conversation around hormone therapy, is comfortable prescribing hormone therapy, and now I'm seeing these women in their 60s and 70s in my clinic because they have osteoporosis and they've never been on hormones and they were never even offered a conversation around hormones. They never had a discussion of risk and benefit. It's just like it didn't exist. So let's fast forward 20 years. So now we have this study. We have a study that comes out that looks at the 20-year follow-up of these 2002 data points. This is a really big deal. So now we have updates on what is the risk of cancer, heart disease, heart attack, stroke, blood clots like pulmonary embolism. We have updates on the stratification of these risks by age, meaning that because we had this broad group of 50 to 79, now we can look and say by decade, what happened in the 50 to 59 group, the 60 to 69 group the 70 to 79 group. And we have some really compelling data to review. So where I wanna start is with the difference by age, particularly in the risk around heart attack and stroke, because this is something that we talk about every day. And it is heartbreaking for me because what we've been trained in, what we've been taught is that if you are a woman who is over 10 years out is really how I was trained, but really more so now I'm, I'm looking at 20 years out, but definitely as you age, the risk of having a cardiovascular event a blood clot, stroke, all of those risks increase the longer you are out from menopause. And I still think that's true. 
But how much is that true? What is the actual risk? And that's been really hard to put a finger on. What this study shows is that the risk does increase in all of those things, but marginally. And I'll talk about the estrogen alone trial later, but in the combined trial, it does increase, but really not by very much, and it never reaches statistical significance. So when I saw the study, I actually took it to my, my team and I said, look, we need to reconsider how we're how and when we are restricting people from receiving estrogen as they age. We have been very diligent about doing cardiovascular imaging and looking at risk factors. And I think that's still reasonable, but there's probably women who have not been offered estrogen in our practice even, who I think probably should be candidates based off of cardiovascular risk alone. Now, when you look at the group as a whole, they talk about in this study, a review of 13 year follow-up, looking at this cardiovascular disease risk. And what they found is that yes, initially it did go up in the intervention group, but 13 years later, that risk actually returned to baseline. That significant difference that they saw in the entire group as a whole early on, that was one of the reasons why they stopped the study, actually went back to zero. So across all age groups, there was no risk for an increase of all-cause mortality. There was no difference technically by age, again, because I said as you go up, the risk does go up, but it never reaches statistical significance between age groups. So one of the studies they talk about in this paper is a 13-year follow-up. And this 13-year follow-up is looking at cardiovascular risk as described in the entire group, starting at the initial study that came out in 2002. And now remember, increased in cardiovascular disease risk and events is one of the reasons why they stopped that study. But after 13 years of additional follow-up, that risk actually went back down to zero or the same as placebo. This was true not only in the group as a whole, but actually as you looked at the individual groups, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, there was an increase in risk as women age, but there was not a statistically significant difference between any of the groups. So there was technically no difference by age. What's even more relevant is that if they were considered to be lower risk based off of a favorable lipid profile, being metabolically healthy, that that risk even again went further away. So it went more back to zero if you could extrapolate people who were uh, more metabolically healthy and had a favorable lipid profile. And so this is kind of how we've done it all along, but this really helps to validate our approach, which is if you can risk stratify someone from a cardiovascular disease perspective, even if they're in their 70s, it's probably not unreasonable to offer them estrogen therapy if they have a compelling reason to do so. And so we are looking at, at individuals as they come in and if they are metabolically healthy, meaning that they don't have prediabetes or diabetes, if we do some kind of imaging to demonstrate that they do not have significant plaque burden, we look at family history, we look at labs like ApoB, we look at LP little a, we look at their history of cholesterol over the last 20, 30 years. If all those things check out, why wouldn't we offer them something that from my perspective, if they have osteoporosis, can help them to improve their bone health, not a little bit, significantly. So this is a, a, a pretty big shift for our practice. We've, we've already been doing it, but we've been doing it with reservation and hesitation, and I think we need to be more aggressive about this. All right, but what you might be thinking to yourself is, well, what about breast cancer? I didn't come here to talk about cardiovascular disease. I got it. So this study in 2002 that came out, the original combined therapy study showed that breast cancer cases, the diagnosis did increase by 24%, although it never reached statistical significance. At 20 year follow-up though, the original data showed in this 2002 study that the breast cancer rates did go up by 24%, although it was never statistically significant. The 20 year follow-up data show though that not only did it reach statistical significance, that it persisted and that breast cancer risk in this group is likely real. Now, there's a kind of an intermediate study here where they talked about the breast cancer mortality difference that faded at 20 years. So mortality actually started to fade at 20 years. There was no difference in mortality in that the intervention, they talk about this in the study, the intervention likely increased the frequency of mammograms, biopsies, and abnormal findings. So again, you're going to get more diagnoses, but mortality didn't change. Now, I wouldn't wish a case of breast cancer on anybody, but this is sort of a, a tweener. I'm gonna tell you why this doesn't matter as much when we talk about the estrogen only trial. Another really important point here is that it didn't matter by age, meaning that if you were that 79 year old individual versus that 50 year old individual, there was no difference in breast cancer diagnosis or mortality in those age groups. So it's not what I wanted to see, but again, it doesn't really bother me because we're going to, we're gonna talk about the estrogen only trial and I think you'll be impressed by those numbers. Now, 
I mentioned initially that the colorectal cancer rates significantly improved in the original study in 2002. It improved by 39%, which is pretty darn good. However, that improvement faded. And what the authors talk about in this study is that simply the estrogen and uh, combined uh, hormone therapy, it just delayed the diagnosis. It didn't actually prevent the disease, which is unfortunate. Now, endometrial cancer, though, on the other hand, was reduced, and this was persistent through long-term follow-up. So there does appear to be a protective nature of this combined therapy to the uterus. And then for my bone health individuals here, the hip fracture reduction of 33% did persist after 13 years of follow-up data as well. So the, the hip fracture in the combined group did persist, which is great. So what are my takeaways from the long-term follow-up of the combined group? Well, I, I'm not that interested in this, honestly, because I would never use a progestin for the reasons that I already talked about in here, which is that we know that progestins increase the risk of blood clot. We know that they increase the risk of breast cancer, as that shows here, at least of diagnosis, if not potentially mortality. And lots of other studies that I've reviewed for my book coming out just continue to reinforce the fact for me that I would never prescribe a synthetic progesterone or a progestin. But let's talk about the estrogen only trial because this is where this gets really interesting and where this does actually come into play for my patients because we are prescribing and utilizing estradiol as a tool, although not orally. Before we get there though, if you're having a hard time putting together what's right for you and you want some help, consider our free masterclass, which is where we go through together in a group on Zoom, our approach to bone health. We leave about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Tens of thousands of individuals have found this to be helpful for them to help them getting on their own path and their own journey. It's something that we do about every week or every other week. And again, it's a really good way to get kickstarted on your own program. You can look for the link in the description on YouTube, or you can go to optimalhumanhealth.com and you can sign up for that there. All right, so let's talk about the estrogen alone group. Now, again, this was CEE, conjugated equine estrogen, or Premarin, which is an oral formulation. And it's not a formulation that I particularly like, but let's look at what it shows because it is probably some of the, the best data. I say that in quotes for those listening to this, but it's some of the best data that we have on long-term outcomes in a large group. So we have to take it for what it is. Now, the initial trial showed in this group, the CEE only group or estrogen only group, there was a reduction in coronary heart disease and heart attack, but a small increase in some of the clotting things like PE. And there was a favorable effect for younger women in the 50 to 59 group that faded as people aged. So that's sort of what happened. And this study was published in 2004, that initial trial of estrogen only. Now, the 18-year follow-up, which is 11 years after the intervention ended, when compared with placebo, the estrogen was associated with a reduction in all-cause mortality, which is kind of cool. That was exclusively, though, to the women in the 50 to 59 years old. So we've kind of heard this over and over again from several studies over the last 20 years or so, that if you are early postmenopausal, defined as in the first decade after going through the, the onset of menopause, then you are likely to benefit from menopausal hormone therapy or estrogen therapy because of the cardiovascular benefits. And this also shows then a decrease in all-cause mortality, which is also really helpful. They also go on to say that there was a study that showed that after 7.4 years of treatment, the coronary artery calcium values, meaning if you were to get an imaging study of your heart uh, blood vessels, that those values were significantly lower among those that were on the estrogen compared to those that were on placebo, meaning that estrogen seems to be protective of the calcification of the coronary arteries which also makes sense. So the takeaway from those two kind of sub-studies and subgroups is that estrogen appears to be protective of heart disease, both progression and events, particularly in a younger postmenopausal uh, group. So that 50 to 59 group, but that second study was in the entire group. So that was in all women. Now, what about cancer? Because again, people like to talk about cancer and estrogen, as they should. So in the initial publication in 2004, what was really not talked about enough <laughs> was that the estrogen-only group had a reduction in the incidence of breast cancer diagnosis. I'm going to say it again. A reduction, meaning it did not cause breast cancer, as most people assumed. It was actually protective of breast cancer. Now, that was not talked about because it went into contradiction of the previous study on combined therapy. And I think a lot of doctors just didn't, they just kind of assumed like, oh, it's, it's hormone therapy in general. I can't use estrogen alone, so this doesn't matter. And that was potentially kind of true depending on how they did it. But this does matter because what this showed is that not only was it protective, 
it was almost as statistically significant protective as the other one was increasing the risk of breast cancer. And so you had these two studies, these two different interventions. One was riskier. The other one was more protective and to the, almost the exact same degree. So that's, I think, really important. Another point there is that, again, just like in the combined group, there was no difference by age, meaning that if you were in the 50 to 59 group versus the 70 to 79 group, there was no difference in the risk of developing breast cancer in either of those groups in that original study published in 2004. So then at 10.7 years of follow-up, the rates of breast cancer diagnosis were not only on the trend of being lower, they were actually significantly lower compared with the placebo group by 23%. That significant risk reduction persisted not just at that 10-year one, but it was actually, again, at the 12-year mark and then again at the 20-year mark. So this finding is huge and shouldn't be understated. Because while the combined group went on to become statistically significant and that persisted over time, although mortality was different, this one was protective and continued to be protective over time. So this statement that estrogen causes breast cancer, again, just continues to boggle me because we see over and over and over again studies that would contradict that. Now, there are studies that show that. But we really have to understand the studies to understand why that potentially could be. And it is certainly controversial. But study after study shows that estrogen therapy is protective of breast cancer if you exclude the synthetic progesterone. If you eliminate that, use a different form of progesterone if you need to use it or want to use it. But estrogen by itself should be protective of breast cancer. Now, a couple other things to point out here is that even in this study, like I said, in the, the combined group, the colorectal cancer benefit also seemed to go away. So indeed, it does look like regardless of which form you're using of these two forms, that neither of them protect from, from colon cancer, which is unfortunate, but there's other ways to protect from colon cancer. Um, and then what about bone health? Now, this is really important because I think people are going to use this data the wrong way. So what this shows is that in the original study, in that 2004 study, that estrogen therapy was protective of hip fracture by 33%. So this is a pretty big, pretty big chunk. After the intervention at 13 year follow-up though, there was no significant effect of estrogen compared to placebo on hip fracture. So how could that be? I'm such a big advocate of estradiol for bone health. How could it be that 13 years later, you would not see the benefit in hip fracture? And here are a couple of thoughts on that. So one is that that oral CEE is only about 1% estradiol. So we know that on bone, you have estradiol receptors. The estrogenic activity is mostly not through estradiol when you're taking Premarin. So are you really getting the protection from bone that you think you're getting? And the answer is, I guess not. We know that estrogen by itself will increase bone mineral density, reduce fracture risk. And in the longest term follow-up we have of those studies, that continues to be true. But I think there's another thing at foot here. So Estrogen is just one tool. And this is where I think people also get, they get very complacent in their approach and they say, well, I'm on HRT, so I don't have to worry about my bones. And that's not true. So women that are on hormone re replacement therapy, especially depending on the therapy, right? So if you're on Premarin, clearly this isn't gonna be true. But if you're on any kind of hormone therapy and it's the only tool you're using, a couple of things might be happening. If you don't have enough estrogen to saturate those receptors, you're not going to get the full and complete benefit of estrogen on those bone receptors, and that could be dependent on levels. But additionally, it's it's not a, a one-size-fits-all kind of tool. So there are multiple things, numerous things that can cause bone loss. And while estrogen is powerful, it's not going to it's not going to counteract all of them as we age. So as we age, it gets harder and harder to control our bone health to slow down that bone loss, and estrogen will lose its power over time. So that's why I feel like you know, people might misuse this data and say, oh, well, look, estrogen isn't protective of, of bone health and fractures. Don't use it. That's not true. Estrogen is protective of bone, but it shouldn't be used as a standalone tool. It needs to be part of a comprehensive program. That's why we do what we do. Now, before I talk about the impact of our practice, just one other thing to point out, because I hear this a lot, is that estrogen is protective of cognitive function. In this study, they showed that there's no benefit to dementia development and there's no improvement in cognitive function. I always struggle with these studies because if you look at the tools that they're using, they're pretty crude instruments. So I will tell you that my anecdotal experience with my patients is that they certainly feel like they are functioning better from a cognitive perspective. 
It's kind of hard to capture in a, an outcome instrument though. So I take that a little bit with a grain of salt. I also don't use that terminology that often, meaning to say that estrogen improves cognitive function um, because it's certainly not always true in the literature. But anecdotally, I see that that certainly is true. Other positives are that there's a reduced risk of developing diabetes or having metabolic dysfunction. And that makes sense too, because we see that significant improvements in biomarkers after a woman goes on HRT if they haven't been on it for a while in menopause. Now in this study, what's interesting is that they go on to say that newer formulations, specifically estradiol alone as an estrogen through a transdermal approach may further reduce the risks that are already reduced in this study. And they go on to say particularly blood clot events like PE and stroke, et cetera. And that's certainly true. And that's why we use transdermal estradiol. Um, I wish they would have also mentioned potentially that hip fracture could also be prevented if you were to stay on estradiol transdermally at appropriate levels, but they didn't say that. So then what's the big takeaway? Because I know this is kind of a longer video, but there's so much to unpack here. So what this shows is that the Women's Health Initiative long-term data supports that estrogen alone is protective of breast cancer, decreases the risk of metabolic dysfunction, reduces fracture risk initially, but doesn't stand up over the long term. It's protective of heart disease and heart attack in women 50 to 59 years old. And there's no significant difference in risk in starting estrogen therapy, regardless of age up to the age of 79. There's a trend towards risk worth considering in that age group. But again, statistically, there was no difference. The blood clotting issues can be explained by the oral preparation and the fact that it came from horses and is a synthetic form of estrogen. Now, overall on progestin therapy, that it increases the risk of breast cancer, at least of diagnosis. It increases the risk of heart attack, of stroke, and a pulmonary embolism, which again is why we won't use it. Colon cancer benefits may have just been delayed diagnosis. The fracture risk reduction, the changes th doesn't really bother me. I still know why we use it and I still know how to use it for our patients. In our patients, we see immediate changes in bone turnover markers, like within a week, right? But again, if used alone, I would expect it to fade because all of the other causes of bone loss have to be taken into account as well. So estrogen alone is not going to likely stand up over time. It's not gonna to continue to improve bone mineral, bone mineral density over time if somebody is sitting on the couch, not doing impact, not working on muscle mass, not eating the right food. It's just not strong enough. So in our practice, what I'm talking to my team about, because again, this just came out this week. So what I'm talking to my team about is potentially being a little bit more liberal with use of hormone replacement therapy in our older patients. Going back and looking to see who isn't on HRT that could be on HRT. We're also looking at different levels and uh, making sure that everybody is at an appropriate level to saturate bone receptors. And then just being very cognizant of the fact that we are having a, a honest discussion of the current evidence because it continues to change, right? So my conversation with patients this week was different than my conversation with patients last week. Trying to stay up to date on this because it's so critical that we are reversing the the mistakes, the errors in thinking and the recommendations that have been made over the last 25 years. So I hope all that makes sense. If you would like to watch some other videos, we have a video looking at estrogen from a couple of different perspectives. We have one on estrogen specifically, we have one on menopause specifically. And I want you to remember as you go through this that the osteoporosis diagnosis is not an end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I hope you found this helpful. I'll see you in the next video.